So good uh, morning, end of the morning to everyone. Uh, we're very excited to start the session on information. And I have here with me uh, these great specialists on this. I'm not a specialist on information, so it's, uh, it's a challenging uh, point uh, to be at now. Uh, but my name is Maria Teresa Diniz, and I'm a trained architect working for the USP Cidades, which is a research center from the University of Sao Paulo that was recently set up. Can you hear me? Is it uh, loud enough? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, and, well, I, I grew up learning a lot, listening actually to a lot of information on computers and information because my father is in the data processing area and everything was really weird for me as a child. I, I couldn't explain very well what my father was doing uh, when my, my friends asked. I didn't understand very well what was uh, data warehousing or information technology, intelligence, business intelligence and, and all these words. And it's, it's funny to see how we're uh, very much connected now nowadays and we're listening to these words more and more and data mining and and uh, all these, these uh, fancy words that are becoming uh, very common to our ears. Uh, I had a, as my first experience on using data, um, I had the, the opportunity to work for the municipality of Sao Paulo for the past eight years before being at uh, the university. And we, we, I was part of a team who developed an uh, information system called Abispi, which is an information system for housing. And it was uh, a lot of fun to be part of this in the municipality and working on selecting the, the demand for social housing and for precarious settlements and also prioritizing the interventions for the government uh, as we have a whole bunch of slums, uh, over 1,600 slums in Sao Paulo and the challenge is not very small. So prioritizing according to infrastructure or to risk area, to technical risk or social vulnerability and health indexes and all these discussions that um, uh, was, was part of our, our daily lives during these this past years. Um, and so I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, we have uh, Jasper Broad, Head of Innovation uh, and, and Partnerships and Alliances from Ericsson in, in Latin America. And we have here Rosemary Freeman, uh, director of uh, Global Research in John Lang's uh, La Salle. Uh, Hokin uh, Kung, sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly, Assistant Chief Executive uh, Infocom uh, Development Authority of Singapore. And last but not least, Kim Bo, Deputy Head, Department of Urban Planning and Management, School of Public Affairs in the Renmin University in China. Okay, so. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Rosemary. She's going to talk about her experience in, in this field. And we're going to have the debate after everybody speaks. Okay? Thanks very, thanks very much. C can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll shout up. Put your hand up if you can't hear. So I thought, I thought I knew what I was going to talk about today until I heard some fantastic terms yesterday during the sessions. Let, let me remind you of a couple that are really good. I heard the words digital exhaust, the quantified self, limited cognitive energy, which I certainly am familiar with, electronic nervous systems, cityness, and perhaps the most interesting one, the poetry of the city. Yeah. And this put me in mind very much of a cautionary poem about cities that I could share with you. If anybody has ever read Shelley, you might know this one. It's about an ancient mythical city that crumbled into the sand and all that's left is a broken statue of its demonic ruler. And it was called Ozymandias. And the quote that's written on the bottom of this statue is, look upon my works ye mighty and despair well i think if he'd have had information his city may not have crumbled into the sand but it's certainly a cautionary tale for us because all of these apps that we heard about this morning are something becoming far more popular with cities around the world and if 
Ozymandias maybe had known a bit more about the potholes in his citizens' satisfaction and fixing his streets, his city would still be standing. But it did make me always wonder, this poem, about why cities can fail and what they need to do to create success. And information is clearly an answer. Well, my background is real estate. So for us, the challenge, I believe, is lifting real estate from what many people think is a, a very staid, very opaque, very static position, and to digitize it and pour all that information into the molten lava flow of information that is going around cities at the moment to make cities live. And it's, it's very interesting that I think it was Saskia yesterday said that cities are not about the built environment. Well, I would obviously say that without a built environment, people would struggle. So this question of how we informate buildings, how we use the information about buildings to make cities live is really very important. And to my way of thinking, we need to have this sort of digital innards of cities turned inside out. And there's three types of data, I would say, in my market that we're trying to exploit more. The first type of data about buildings themselves is hard data. There's been huge amounts of progress about this over the years. As you know, a lot of the sustainability drivers are there. We know about footprint and carbon emissions and water leakage. We know about recycling and energy use. So that's great. That's coming along nicely. And the private sector certainly are doing a lot uh, according to those type of priorities of sustainability. Then there's what you might call soft data how the users of buildings react to them. And we're talking the human city here, remember. And something different is happening there. And that is that consumers and users are taking control of the data about buildings through a lot of the apps that we're hearing about, through a lot of the social media outlets, the employers blogging and tweeting about their employment and working conditions, customers talking about their retail and shopping experiences. All this is in the public domain and will not and cannot be ignored by developers and those that invest in buildings. That is changing the game. But there's another form of data which we would call emotional data about the physical presence and the physical feeling of a city. And that's something that we don't know much about. Whether or not architecture creates happiness as you walk around, whether or not certain styles of building make you feel secure or upset your equilibrium. There's a lot more to be collected, which is why this whole question, to my way of thinking of data, is getting really, really important now. So three types of data, and I would say that there's four buckets of change that are going to hit the real estate industry, cities, and citizens. And just to highlight them, I would say that the first one is about these great words, quantitative urbanism, cities in numbers, and the science of cities. You may have read the work of uh, people like Mike Batty at UCL in London, or Jeffrey West, if you haven't, I recommend TED Talks by Jeffrey West, who is now turning the, the idea of cities inside out. He says all cities are just one big mathematical problem. And he's unearthing so many new relationships between data that I think this will create a lot of change when we really understand the dynamics and efficiencies of spatial footprints of cities, how buildings are really used, what citizens like and don't like, and of course a whole lot about transport and accessibility. Planners of the future will be urban scientists. And that is a big change in the way we're able to analyze, record, and change our cities, hopefully for the better. The second area I would call 
information entrepreneurship. We've heard a lot already about this question of the three Ps of data, about privacy, about potential, and about the politics of data, because data does have a very political dimension in terms of its collection and its use. But this whole market for information, it's not new, but my goodness, is it growing at a rate it's hard to even keep a track of. So really understanding the rhythm of the city is going to be important, certainly for my market in real estate. The third one is, is more challenging because if you think about all of us being encoded, buildings are encoded, we are walking sensors because we have all of these sensors around cities and on our persons that will be able to give information and look at cities in a very different way from the art of Banksy to all sorts of interesting um, uh, newfound ways of, of creating a spirit of a city, then that becomes potentially constraining. So my view is that buildings themselves will have to differentiate because you'll know everything about them. So perhaps when we value real estate, a new valuation could be in the ability of the building to surprise. The fourth, the fourth area, which is in there somewhere, is really about the dark area, I think, of information. And that is, and it was quite inspiring this morning hearing about participation. Because what we don't know much about is the social return on investment of big projects in cities. We know all the economics and we know the finances, but how do they really affect every one of us as individuals? That's what big data will be able to explore. And I think when it comes back, we may get some big surprises about what we think is good about a city and what really is good in terms of social value in the human city. So my conclusion is, and the reason why Shelley is always in the back of my mind is, using data, we don't want to be in a situation ourselves in 100 years time when we're looking back and saying, look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we would like to listen to Kung Hoon Yang, please. Okay, well, hello everybody. My name is Kung. I come from Singapore, <coughs> and um, my responsibility in ID is uh, primary in the area of infrastructure development and uh, next generation services. And I'm also the chief data officer uh, for IDA. Uh, one of the projects that I've done in, um, in, in uh, IDA is um, we have put in place a fiber to the home and businesses. So over the last four years, we have rolled out uh, fiber uh, to the whole of Singapore. Uh, we have now over 30% of the homes have already been enjoying the fiber services. Uh, they get typically something in the range of 100 to 300 megabits per second and paying something in the range of about 30 uh, US dollars a month for 200 uh, megabits per second up and down. Um, by providing fiber everywhere uh, to every home and every uh, businesses, it has caused a huge transformation in the way people work, in the way people play, in the way uh, even entrepreneurship develops. And I suppose that's one point I'm trying to make here, which is for governments, we look at what we need to do, what governments need to do, and how that would that empower the people and the private sector to do whatever they should be doing. Um, two years ago, when we, uh, sorry, no, four years ago when we first started, we have two service providers nationwide that provides uh, fixed wire services. Uh, right now, in the span of four years, the number of service providers have now increased to 22. So from 2 to 22, and prices have dropped significantly. I think as we move forward into the new world, into the new urban uh, world, where I think data is like our digital footprint. Everywhere you go, you leave something behind. There's probably a need for some form of uh, data infrastructure, which we haven't quite 
fully figure out what that needs to be. Now we have the pipes in place which allows data to flow very quickly from one point to another. What does such a data infrastructure needs to be? How do you help people to find data that they need, or data sets that they need? How do they know what sort of data set they're getting? What sort of quality of data set? How recent they are? Uh, whether they are as accurate as you want, whether they're fit for purpose. So in a sense, a little bit of a crowdsourcing to recommend what some of this uh, data is like. For governments, I think as we move forward, we are also very conscious of one thing, which is I think governments can play a big role in better enabling uh, through data, uh, better enabling the public and also the private sector to do whatever they need to do. Uh, so from that perspective, even in the way governments have been delivering uh, services, uh, what I think we are quite used to is governments talking about number of applications, number of services they deliver, a few thousand here and there. But that, of course, presumes that that's the way that you as a citizen or you as a business want to see that service. So we have to now move towards a paradigm in which a government acts as a platform an enabler rather than finally a, a, a service that delivers to you in a certain format. So from that perspective, uh, one of the things that Singapore would have to look at is that while we have been very, very successful in delivering e-government and we are you know, rated one, number one in the world, number two in the world as far as doing e-government is concerned, is how that would evolve in the future as more and more uh, uh, requirements for citizen participation and also business participation in the things we do. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, I think we must be quite careful that there is ultimately a central core that must work. And the central core is that the government must work. If the government doesn't work, you can have all the interfaces to government and your pothole will not get fixed. You can take all the pictures you want, but the pothole will remain there. So governments need to work and government needs, you need ultimately still good government. So that's not something that at the end of the day we can get away from. So you have obviously the, the, the voting box which can put governments in place. Uh, but of course also helping governments to be successful by giving your feedback, by participating. And of course every single person, like what the preliminary just said, every single person has their own requirements, has their own important issues. The question is in the dom democracy, how do you resolve those issues? Governments need to prioritize, they need to determine what important things to do, national resources need to employ. People know the situation on the ground much better. How does the two work together? And how does all this data that gets generated, it gets managed, it gets used by both governments and people and businesses? Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker would be Jasper. Yes. Well, I think it's, it's very clear from the two contributions that we have heard already that the, uh, the new city is a connected city. Um, not only do I think that it's important to have uh, fiber connectivity, as we hear, to buildings, to homes, and to offices, but I think what we have seen lately, and a few months back, I saw that we now have 6.5 billion mobile phones in the world, corresponding to a penetration of 90%, which is something that no one would have guessed 10 years ago that we would ever reach the result that we have today. And this has a huge impact. So the new city is a connected city. And it's a connected city where we have connectivity anytime, anywhere, which means that we have to be with mobile connectivity. So connectivity is basically regarded as an infrastructure, just like water, just like electricity, for instance. And many of the instances of new ideas being developed for new cities are done through applications. And that is why there was the uh, application award earlier uh, this morning. And those can be applications. We've seen all the uh, examples here. It can be e-government, emergency services, application based on location or interest, 
uh, applications based on shared ownership. We see cars, houses, and other things that people can share, or it can be smarter traffic. Just to give an example of, I think, the impact that we can take and feel here for Sao Paulo, uh, the magazine, the Brazilian well-known magazine, the Zami, came out with an article last month saying that on a yearly basis, the city of Sao Paulo is losing correspondingly 40 billion reais. That would be roughly 20 billion US dollars just in people being clocked up in traffic, traffic jams. And this is just one thing that smart applications and doing smarter traffic can do a lot about. That's just one issue about it, which is that these applications need to be connected. We need to be connected at any time and anywhere, as I mentioned already, in order for this result to kick through. This is why we at Ericsson, uh, some months back, introduced a new concept of application coverage. So normally, when we look at connectivity, mobile connectivity, we look at the voice uh, quality of doing voice calls. But what we see now is that the new city will be very much based on new type of applications that will be developed and presented all the time. So this new type of coverage is very important. And I would just like to share with you some of the particularities that there is with this coverage. Now, the example that I'm showing here is what we call the antenna of the base station, which is the basic infrastructure by which we connect all our mobile phones. And it happens to be this uh, way that if we just do normal voice calls, as you can see to the uh, right of this slide here, we can send uh, simple messages, we can receive emails, and we do voice calls that we can do in a quite large distance to the infrastructure. Uh, if we want to listen to streaming music, very popular services coming up, but we want to instant messages, messages and stuff like that, send a few photos, well, then the distance requirement actually becomes more tough. And we can only do this closer to the infrastructure, closer to the antennas. And if you want to do what many people really look forward to be, being able to do now, um, see films, TV, uh, do video calls, uh, download and share archives, for instance, or access data in a broader uh, terms, we should remember that smartphones today, which on the first quarter of this year made out 50% of all the phones sold worldwide, well, these smartphones, they are basically as powerful as a desktop uh, computer was five years ago with all the graphic functionalities that it has. We now has this, have this in our hands today, and it needs to be connected in order to work. These phones, they have high-definition screens. They can do high-definition recordings in real time. So uh, the constraints and the requirements for the network are much higher than it was uh, when we were working, only working with voice. So if we look at an average city, uh, as by the example that I have here, and we try to evaluate the connectivity that we have by doing traditional voice calls, as it's shown on this figure here, and we look at the coverage that there is in the city, Today, we will find that the coverage is actually pretty good. We cover the city pretty well. And in most of the places where we want to place voice calls and we want to talk with people, we can actually do that. But what we also know is that people actually talk less and communicate more with other applications and other services. So what we need to do is to evaluate the quality of the connectivity that we have if we want to look at videos, for instance. And the problem is today that in many places in the cities, we are not able to do that. We are actually not able to take the benefit of what we could really get uh, if we were able to use those applications at any place. So what you could see on, on this uh, slide here is that the, the, the wide areas in coverage are actually significantly smaller with the same infrastructure, with the same antennas uh, that you have to serve uh, voice calls today when you compare um, with what we call the data coverage. And we made a survey, Ericsson um, has a laboratory we call Consumer Lab. And we made a global survey and we included a few cities in Latin America where we look at users' degree of satisfaction with the coverage that they have. And the two cities here were Buenos Aires and Lima. And what we saw was that smartphone users 
had roughly 50% of them um, were satisfied with the coverage for voice calls in those cities all around, which is actually a bit less than what I was just slowing, showing on this figure here. But when it comes to what we call application coverage, meaning basically that they could access and use whatever application they had, whatever it might be, social networks, Facebook, Google applications, or uh, e-governments, or smarter traffic, or whatever I, uh, I just mentioned, the degree, degree of satisfaction fell from the 50% to 35%. So actually, the conclusions that I would like you to take from my contribution is here that the basic infrastructure of connectivity and internet access has to be significantly better than what we see in most cities today in order for this positive effect to kick through. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, I think it was last year that uh, Lady Gaga came for a concert in Brazil and she complained about the coverage. <laughs> And Brazilians were really mad that she was uh, saying, oh, 3, 3G in Brazil doesn't work. But uh, I think many Brazilians actually agree with her. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to listen to Kimbo, please. OK. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kimbo. I come from China. I work in for the Renmin University of China in the Department of Urban Planning and Management. Uh, my English is not that good, so <laughs> I will try to slow down and uh, help you understand my points. So it's my pleasure to come here and share of some of my thoughts and uh, our projects we have done in Beijing, which is about how we use information or how we try to maximize the use of information. Uh, here are two, uh, three points I want to make. The first point is that actually information nowadays are very important. So that is the topic of today's session, information as the new urban utility. Yes, as urban planners nowadays, uh, when we do urban, plan, uh, do urban planning for a lot of Chinese cities, we argue that actually uh, there are more than just, you know, when we're talking about utility or, utility or the infrastructure, it got more than road, electricity, gas, those things. You got to think about how to create or establish a better information network for the urban residents in those cities. Because information nowadays are very important. Uh, for example, actually yesterday a huge storm uh, hit Beijing. And uh, compared with the last year, actually last year a huge storm hit Beijing and that storm caused very bad urban flooding in certain area of that city and it caused about 70%, 70% lost their life. But yesterday, a quite similar storm hit Beijing, but because we have a something like SMS notifying system so that government can use text to notify people you best stay at home because we have this storm. So because of this kind of system, we, uh, we cannot say we save a lot of people's lives, but at least it's a good thing. Uh, so uh, it's quite important. And that's the first point I want to make. And the second point is that uh, based on some projects we have done for some local governments in Beijing, uh, we conclude that actually information when we try to use information, it's not only about technology innovation. Sometimes, if we want to use information, if we want to create a so-called digital uh, system, sometimes that gives you opportunity to reconstruct or re re reform, reform the government's governing mechanisms. Uh, a case in point is that actually we help one district in Beijing, that is Chaoyang District. We help them to establish a so-called uh, digital urban management system there. And by doing such a system, actually different agents or different authorities in that local government make clear what they need to do. For example, for this uh, particular area, before we create this system, these agents uh, there's some problem happened in that uh, space, and these agents probably say that that's not my business, this should be otherwise. But when we create this system, uh, all the lands in that district, all the problems happened in that district, they have a clear 
uh, agents to deal with the problems. So, so I think that that's very important. So it's not only about tech, technology things, it's also about institutional reforms, institutional innovations. That's the second point I want to make. And the third point I want to make is that actually as, a, as uh, scholars in universities, we, we, we start some collaborations with the local governments and we help them to try to find more useful information from their so-called digital urban management systems. For example, one project we are doing for that Chaoyang district is that we try to build up some, it's about seven so-called decision support system. Uh, one decision su uh, support system is about form location decision, decision support system. We try to use all the information they have for example, like what kind of firms they locate, for example, like finance firms, where are they, restaurants, where are they. We use those information and we build up models to predict what will be the next firm's location choice. So we establish this system and we think actually this system will be beneficial for the new firms if they want to go to that district and start their business there. Uh, that's one example. Uh, and another very interesting example is that about a uh, so-called uh, community health health care decision support system. That is actually we collect a lot of information from different hospitals in Beijing so that we know uh, for certain communities perhaps a lot of people or residents in that community are suffering from same disease or even flu like SARS or bird flu, something like that. If we have those information, we can make decisions. We can notify those residents in such community. You better be careful about certain disease. So that is we try to seek wisdom from the information. We try to make the best use of information. I think that is something we can do as you know, scholars or as universities. Uh, yeah, I think that's... Thank you very much. <laughs> so the, the idea for, for the, the debate is I'm um, going to have a couple of questions to the participants and then we're going to open for your participation. And I'd like to make this very informal, so uh, even if I ask Rosemary something, feel free to jump in if you, if you also want to to participate in the same question, okay? Uh, and the, there's some topics that um, I thought of for, for the debate that I'd like to share with you. Uh, the first one, uh, data real, uh, reliability and obsolescence. Obsolescence, sorry. Access to data and privacy issues. Scale of the data. The emotion and the sentiment of the users. Human behavior. Uh, representativeness of the population and transforming data into knowledge. Okay, so these are some of the topics that we're going to be discussing today. So, um, Kim, you're talking about uh, a work that you did with the, the, from the university with the government in Beijing. Um, I'd like, I'd like to, to ask you, how was this relationship when we were building the methodology for the systems for the government how, how was uh, working with them and did they fear, uh, did they have fear uh, of sharing the information and the data with the general public? How, how did they feel about the privacy issues of the data? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Actually, when we start these collaborations, uh, the local governments actually, they are quite afraid that we may release their data to the general public. Actually, we kind of differentiate data into different categories. Actually, for some kind of data, it should be confidential. It's classified. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you certainly, you don't want what kind of disease you have. Uh, but uh, everybody knows it. That that's, that's a problem, right? Uh, we should protect normal people's privacy. So that is a, a problem we are facing. So basically, we try to use those original data and we try to you know, work on those data and uh, we come out some data. Uh, local governments 
feel it's safe to share with general public and can help uh, whatever the firms or the residents or the other government agents can use. So, so that is we differentiate data into different category. Yeah, some you can share and the, for others you better keep it in your mind or in your computer. So you'd say that after classifying the data, you have different levels of access yeah, according yeah. to who needs to use it and, and okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Rosemary, how, how can you capture, you were talking about emotion and sentiment, how can you capture this data? Have, are there methodologies available for that? Well, I have seen one really interesting app from uh, the London School of Economics, and they call it the Mappiness app, i.e. happiness, but it's mapped. And what they started out with was a, a simple experiment that went out to maybe 100 people, and they said, and it is self-reporting, and there are issues, I guess, with self-reported data, but they said three or four times a day, can you just stop, take out your smartphone, and on the smartphone is three or four questions about how you're feeling related to where you are. So are you in an office, a shopping center? Are you in the countryside? Are you on the train? And they asked people to rank their feeling at that particular moment. How they, were they scared, happy, sad, mm -hmm. frustrated? And so people did, and it became so popular that in a very short space of time, they had thousands and thousands of people filling in this information because there was such a need and want to respond to people about, I want you to know how I'm feeling in this particular physical place because it's important. And now that app is spreading all over the place. And if you think about what Google are doing as well, where um, I was hearing just yesterday that they have a, a, an ID badge that they test out with workers that actually tells everything about the worker, the heart rate, how fast you're breathing, whether or not you're laughing or coughing in a similar way, looking at the health issues. All of this type of data can be put together and suddenly each and every one of us is a walking sort of table of how we're feeling. And I think that is the next stage in thinking about development and how developers and real estate really respond to the emotions of the population. Thank you. And, uh, and you have a very interesting work uh, on um, the pros, the humanizing aspects of, of data and the cons, the, the, we'll say the dehumanizing aspects of, of the data. And you're talking about how behavior uh, can be changed after you have access to the data or if you're, you're communicating with the data. And I think it's inter interesting how uh, some things that are very little in our daily basis, for example, that right now when you go to somebody's, uh, to a friend's house or in, in Brazil, you don't ask for reference points anymore. You just, oh no, just give me the address and I'll just put it in the GPS. And maybe that changes the way we perceive the cities. Uh, that you're not paying attention to those res reference points that you would if you had a different way of, of driving, of getting to this place. And I, I'd like to, to ask you, um, if, if people are participating and that might be changing their behavior, how representative is, there, is that participation for uh, political policies? If, who are we listening to and how can we be sure that when we're setting up uh, political policies according to these participations that we're actually getting the society's uh, participation in all its uh, voices? <coughs> well, I think first and foremost, um, you can liken much of the participation like maybe even a society. A society has got certain purposes and people join it. But within a society, there are probably far too many members and uh, different interests that at some point in time you ask yourself, how does a society really represent my interests? And so what happens is that special interest groups are then formed. 
So within those smaller groups, and it can even form smaller groups below that, each one of the interests is then better looked into. So in a similar analogy, I mean, the government is, is, is elected, is there to be able to provide jobs, provide quality of living, provide health care, etc., etc., and that's what it's meant to do. There might be a group of people who have a special interest in a particular area. They might be particularly interested in education, in parent involvement, in how curriculum is developed. They might be interested in whether they have the right uh, types of civic uh, institutions that are set in place. And so they should participate. If you think about it, the internet has lowered the cost, the, the transaction cost, for people to communicate with each other. So in, I think in a similar way, the social media has also lowered the cost for different special interest groups to come together. Because if, if it's very difficult and very expensive for people to come together and interact and, and work towards the areas that they are interested in, and they're always coming to the government for funding, for support, then there can be only so many interest groups that can be out there. But now with the internet, with people being able to use all sorts of social media to come together, interact, and form groups, and sometimes form feedback groups, study groups, policy groups that engage that among themselves or with businesses or with governments, the fact that so many of them, it allows people to then feel that they are part of the, uh, the process to influence and get things done. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the part that's important. But underpinning a lot of this, uh, this is, of course, there will be lots of data flowing back and forth. Then the question of privacy and related things tend to come up as well. I think one of the things we have to bear in mind is that today we use credit cards and we use a lot of stuff. So your digital footprint is everywhere. Where you check into the hotel and where you stayed, etc., it's what plane you took. They're everywhere. So why is it that we are not so worried uh, when actually so much of our lives is uh, put out there? Um, I think because there's an element of trust that whoever is collecting this information from you is delivering a service which you sort of expect. And that as long as you trust that party, you don't have that much of an issue. But as long as that party does something that's beyond your normal expectation, or worse still, does something which you think is really against your interests, then I think the whole privacy debate comes up. So governments collect a lot of information, whether they want it or not. Very often I look at the, the way even some of my departments in IDA the way they collect uh, information is they take the template, they copy the same template, they fill in additional things, and they just keep collecting lots and lots of stuff. So now, within government, we're trying to put in place a situation whereby there are certain costs of collecting data and keeping the data. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you only collect what you really, really need. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, the more data you have, the better you are able to plan for urban planning, for example, like where you need to put civic institutions, where your tourists are going to, uh, what sort of events is particularly interest to them. So the more data you have, the, 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 the more effective your planning can be. So as long as the data is collected and used in a way that a, a reasonable man expects and the, 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 the line of trust is not breached, I think that is fine. But ultimately, as I said, it comes back to whether you have a good government. And uh, there might be a question there as well that if people are not worried about uh, providing their information or sometimes if they're not aware of the amount of information they're providing every day and then who are using, uh, who's using this information. So Jasper, I'd like to ask you about this. Um, who owns the information? Is it okay to sell the information? I know this is very polemical, but... <laughs> it's an interesting question with you today is, um, beside Ericsson, I spent a couple of years as president of the board of Mobile Marketing Association for Latin America, and um, this is something that we are discussing a lot uh, within those organizations, and um, basically you could see, you, you can cut this cake into various slices, but I think you could say in general there are three or more types of data, there's public data, um, there are commercial data and there are private data. The public data, what I see is that, well, both in Brazil, I see some new laws on transparency, not so much on the digital level yet, but it's more uh, making the public administration transparent. Um, 
but I see a lot of projects in, in the European uh, community. I've, being Danish, I'm also following what's happening in Denmark, specific areas and ministries that are now working deliberately on opening up the data for the community so they can actually be used. And there are a lot of interesting outcomes coming out from that in, in the public space. So I would basically say that public data should be public unless, of course, as it was mentioned in China, for specific either privacy reasons or security reasons. Then the commercial data, um, I think, is, is a little bit more complex. And I think that many companies today yet has not understood actually how they want to work in the digital space. Um, we've seen lately, for instance, in Brazil, that, that Global, which is the world's if I recall, it's the, still the third largest TV network, and they have decided to leave Facebook and Twitter, totally. Now, I don't know anything about the reasoning behind it, but what I know from the Mobile Marketing Association is that a number of companies are worried about uh, using these platforms uh, for interacting on a social level because they understand, uh, for instance, using Facebook, that Facebook would end up knowing more about their customers than they do themselves and that these information are potentially very valuable and could be traded. And actually, they think that these informations are traded uh, uh, today. So I think these are some of the constraints that many companies work with when it comes to their data. If we look at then the personal data, um, well, first of all, what we see is that uh, we believe that it's great that everything is free. Uh, when it comes to email, when it comes to navigation services, when it comes to a number of cloud services where we take all our notes, we store all our archives. But when it comes to it, it's not really free when we look at it. I mean, this data can either be used, for instance, for uh, segmentizing, and we will end up one day probably having the price of our insurance or other services, either these things are not even offered to us or not even accessible to us, depending on the profile that we leave on the internet or we're going to be priced differently. So we can actually end up paying more for different services just because of the behavior that we have on the web. Uh, so I think this is, this is actually quite polemic. There was a case in the US uh, a few months back. My person was using a pacemaker. And he went every six months to his doctor and the information that the pacemaker gathers about his health. And he was working, like Rosemary said, he was really working with the quantified self. So he was using the Fitbit armrest and he was using all the uh, gadgets that he could have to collect data about himself. So he wants to do his own biohacking on his own, on his own body. And he thought, well, all the data from my heart would be really great to add to the other data that I collect from myself. So he called the company, which was the owner of this pacemaker and had the equipment and extracted the data, said, could I get a copy of the data that you extract from my body every uh, two or three times a year? And they said, sorry, we cannot give you that data. Because in the contract you have signed, the data belongs to us. And this was really, I think this is really something to think about. Who owns the personal data about us? If we can use this data to go to any physicians or doctor to have him help us become better, how can we do that if we don't own the data about ourselves? You know, we might own our physical body, but our digital body, certainly there are parts of it that we don't own anymore. It belongs to another company. Um, so I think these things are very important to go through. And just finally a remark about, we have mentioned Facebook a few times. Uh, maybe you saw, I was just checking on my, my phone here. I just checked that the market cap, the value on stock price uh, for um, Facebook today is 56 billion US dollars. And if we believe that there are roughly uh, 1 billion users, it means that each of us have generated 50 dollars for this company. Who does this money belong to? Well, we basically are volunteers because, you know, it's a free service, but actually it seems that we are working for a company without, without getting any salary, putting a lot of information in there that somewhere somebody is probably putting some taxes on this in the U.S. It's not even ending up here in Brazil. Or what do I know? Uh, and this value, and this is created voluntarily, and what do we get back from it? Well, we get a free service, which is maybe worth something also. So just to say that, that there are different aspects depending on what type of data we're looking at, and free is not really free the way that we normally seem to perceive it. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Can I ask a question? There's been a lot of talk about what's being called the right to be unknown. Is that ever going to be possible now, or are we beyond ever being able to be off the network? 
This was already commented, I think, about some five or six years ago. Um, the, at that time, it was an event in, um, in um, San Diego, I think it was. The CEO from Sun Microsystems was interviewed about this data and privacy. And his comment about it was really privacy, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I believe today that what we see is that we talk so much about the uh, digital natives. And I think that what we see is a new generation of people that has a very different aspect about being private or not. But on the other hand, I see both cases from the US and I see from Europe where people are being convicted only about data, primarily on data that is captured from social networks today. Uh, so I definitely see that it, has, it can have significant impact on our lives, the way that we hand over and treat our data. So people sometimes come to me and say, so what should I do? Should I leave the network? Should I drop broadband? Should I drop connectivity? No, of course not. But people should learn, and this I think is coming even from primary school, uh, we should learn how to be cautious, and how to have content about how we use the data, uh, what we communicate with who that we communicate, and, and, and how we use the applications, and who is actually owning the data that we have. It's part of fundamental education, I think. May I just add to that? This right to be forgotten, I think it's a new emerging area of debate. Uh, but if you can also think of it as not really a new subject, because it has been with us for some time. Uh, for most countries, we have such a thing called credit bureaus. So there are some people who are just end up on the wrong side of the credit bureau because they forgot to pay their, you know, their bills or whatever. And one day they go to a bank and try to get a loan and the bank rejects them uh, because of one incident that happened in the past. And what you see in the internet nowadays, uh, there may be a situation whereby somebody is wrongly arrested, uh, wrongly accused and then went to the court system, and the person is in fact acquitted. But this person thereafter is never able to get a job, because every time this person applies for a job, some, the, the HR department goes and Googles the internet and finds out that he or she has been arrested before. It just never links up that he or she was ultimately acquitted. See, that, I think, has a negative repercussion. So while we continue to leave a lot of digital footprints around, and you can easily trace back to everything that has happened. But there are obviously downsides. How to deal with those downsides, I think, are the things that we have to um, you know, really think about and uh, get resolution on. So I'd like to open for questions um, to the audience. I'm going to... Oh, she's, she's going to organize it for us. Good. Um, Hazem Galal from PwC. Um, can you, can you say that again? I didn't listen to you. Hazem Galal, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Okay. Um, you've all touched on very important issues about you know, how to move the availability forward. Um, but I would really like to get from the panel their opinions on three key success factors. First of all, um, interoperability. Um, the second is working across silos when the data is available in multiple government departments at different levels or even at the same level. And then last but not least, technical standards. So if we're looking at electric cars designed by Ericsson and Volvo, they are compatible with the ones by Siemens and VW, not like the chargers for cell phones that we have today. Let's take uh, three questions and then we can answer. Yeah? If there are three. Hi, Pamela Puhalski. I'd like to um, make a provocation in, in a definition between ownership and access. And who decides? How do you, def how do you make that definition? Who, who kind of regulates? And within the interest of talking about increased powers of cities and, and autonomy, is there, is there um, kind of a, a move you've seen at the city level to establish agencies that are actually looking at not, not the data that's controlled within the city, state, national governments, but also this example of personal data that, that you may not have access to? Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else?
Hi, uh, Stan Caldwell with Carnegie Mellon University. Um, this, this is just a general question on the infrastructure itself, and maybe Jasper, you might have a, um, a perspective on this. You know, with the proliferation of you know the need for more and more data, um, is is there something new on the horizon that can you know that will be replacing Wi-Fi or that we'll need to in the future just because of the increased uh, bandwidth that we're consuming? All right, uh, who'd like to take the first one? Yeah? On, on the question of data standards, it's always frustrating from the property world to be in an environment where there's so much going on with, with data. To tell you that there is no standard definition, even of what we call a gray day, i.e. a very investment focused building even those definitions differ across the world. So even when you're trying to describe the built environment and the investability in a city, that's quite hard to do. And property data is very competitively held, it's guarded, it's extremely expensive to collect, and therefore it is in the commercial sense um, very, very valuable. From the city point of view, and, and there are efforts to try and get around that, but I've been in property world for 30 odd years and we still haven't achieved it. But coming on to the bigger question of cities, there is something that you may have heard about called the city protocol, which is exactly to that point about trying to standardize across cities. And I think they have 30 or 40 members now, how you sort of compartmentalize data definitions about cities and how you describe them in the right analytical framework. So I think in terms of interoperability, in terms of standards, everybody recognizes they're needed. There's a fair few attempts to make that happen. I do think it'll be a few years yet before we get there. Um. I mentioned earlier that uh, there's probably something that needs to be constructed going forward is uh, really how to treat data or information as an infrastructure. Um, first and foremost, uh, how that infrastructure needs to be created, I think, depends on the attitude of the agency. Uh, in Singapore, we have made a decision that uh, we are moving from an uh, era of what we call government for the people to an era of government with the people. And that's a fundamental mind shift change. Government for the people, an example would be we will create lots and lots of portals. We will tell people this is a service, but this is the way you get the service, full stop. So that's government for you, so to speak. That's government for the people. But government with the people places, I think, the power quite equally between the two parties. That, that then connotes a new impression of how government services, government data, government applications will be delivered to the citizens, which means that then government has to see itself being government as a platform and not government as a, as, as a portal, so to speak. If you take that into consideration, then the next question is how we treat data. And I think the way we treat data today is very much like how software was treated in the past. Uh, in the past, there will be a lot of very good software guys. They write lots and lots of scripts. And the scripts are very useful. And so the scripts get passed around the company. And the scripts you know, help people do things more efficiently. But the scripts are never supported. So by the time something changes in the environment and the scripts break, you go and find who's the guy who originally wrote the script and get him to fix. And he may or may not fix it. That was the early days when software was very much treated as a cottage industry, not as a product. I think data is now in the era where we're treating data like scripts, and we are taking whatever data we have, we're just publishing out there, and you use at your own risk, which means that a person who really wants to build a, a good business around it is really suffering tremendous risk. Um, so if you treat data as a product, then first and foremost, you have to find out what is it that people want? What sort of data do they need? How are they likely to use it very much like a product? There should be some market-related uh, uh, research, some idea of what is your target customers. 
Secondly, there should be a form of a release mechanism for data. Data should be properly versioned. So that at the end of the day, when I change the data or upgrade the data, uh, then the, the, the downstream players who have applications know whether they should pick up the data and what time uh, that will be useful for, for them. So um, that, of course, connotes questions about then what should be the standards, the interoperability related things will all come about because you, you really want to treat data as, as a product. So we are, of course, far from, from anywhere near that, but it's an issue that I think we, we really need to think about if we, if we really think of data as uh, um, uh, something that will be a utility that we use to power a lot of things. Of course, beyond that, products have commercial, some products are free and some products uh, you pay money for, and those are other considerations uh, that would have come in place. I'd, I'd like to add uh, uh, some experience to this, that uh, when we were building the, the, the housing system, the Abispi, uh, it was a huge effort, and it took a lot of time to get to this point, that we were talking to other departments, as he had asked, uh, to get their data uh, and, and so that we would host all the data and all the layers of information and, and, and mapped and, and georeferenced and everything. In so we were able to get, for example, the data from the, the sub-prefeituras in Sao Paulo, the regional administrations, for the risk area. So that's one of the layers in the Abispi. Uh, the, the water company, water and sewage company, Sabespi, they also provided us with their layer, layer for water and sewage networks and connections. And so all these, this, this information on legislation from the municipality, from other secretariats, um, they all add up to a planning tool that, uh, ha that lets you uh, use as, uh, the Abispi as a tool for, for really for planning the housing policy in, in Sao Paulo. And something else, uh, I think on what uh, Pamela had asked, and that uh, I've recently learned uh, from Professor Quintanilla, who is here in the audience, uh, that there's a confusion, uh, in, especially in government, of wanting to own the data in, and not uh, accessing the data. So sometimes they don't, they don't need to have their data and hold the data in their departments as they would like to. Because this data needs to be updated all the time. So it's better that this data stays in their in, the, in each department and that the planning department, for example, has access to see and use and cross-reference all this data, uh, which is a meta metadata, I don't know if that's how it's called in English, and not data mining as people uh, would want in, in government. So that's also something uh, that I've recently learned. I, I thought that was very interesting. Um, I think the concept, the, yeah, but maybe just to add to your point, why government departments tend not to want want to bring out data. My feel is that the sharing of data is an asymmetrical thing. It's asymmetrical in that when a government department has got certain data, if I share it out there, I bear the, the liability and the risk of how that data is used. But what is the benefit to me? So it's an asymmetrical thing. So therefore, I think it's very important that um, the mindset evolve from one where you think of how you can actually have better governance with the people rather than for them. Would, would you have any news on the Wi-Fi uh, future? Or? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, I think it's... Uh, well, first of all, thanks for the question. I think it's, it's, it's very re relevant and, and it gives me the opportunity to reflect on, on, um, on another figure, here, actually. Uh, in the Ericsson Mobility Report that I mentioned that just came out and that's, it's that's open, free information. You can all download it on the Ericsson site if you're interested in looking through it. You'll find that, well, with the, uh, in all the investments and all the efforts we've done today in being able to provide mobile internet, uh, this will only continue growing. And in five years, we believe that the data consumption and the needs on mobile networks will be 12 times as much as it is today. Right, so it means that with all the infrastructure that we from many years back have built up today, we actually have to multiply this by a factor of 12 um, in, within the next five years. So I think that, that's kind of an effort that we have to go through. Uh, then regarding what is coming up on the horizon, I think there, there's, there are several things coming up. I mean, of course, 
<laughs> almost that, of course that. But I mean, we, we right now we're building out the fourth generation of mobile technology, also called LTE, and it, it's quite well rolled out in, in the US with a couple of operators, and we are, we are rolling it out with four operators in Brazil also, and it, this is this is really going going quite fast forward, and 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 and. The works on the next generation, what could be called the fifth generation, is already ongoing. But what I think is, and you always got to get higher numbers and higher speeds and stuff like that, but what I think is really the challenge here is uh, coming back to the word of interoperability. Because in order for us to understand <clears throat> the different type of usage, well, first of all, what we see is that people are using normally uh, mobile broadband or mobility in broadband in shorter distance, for instance, at their homes. We see today that when even when people have high-speed fiber at their homes, what, how they access this is actually still through mobile technology, either Wi-Fi or other types of personal access network technologies that works with very short distances. So what we see is different type of sizes and uh, of the of the network cells and the distance to the infrastructure and the antenna, sometimes just a few meters when we are in our own homes. But what we see at the same time is that in order to cope with this big growth, we take in new trunks of spectrum, I mean new trunks of channels or frequencies or whatever we'll call it, which is actually how we transmit data through the air. And, and, and then another thing is that we still need to get this working with different technologies. So now we have, you know, we have Wi-Fi, we have WiMAX, we have Bluetooth, we have ultra wideband, we have 2, 3, and 4G, and all of this has to work together. So the, the thing about interoperability, both from a technology perspective, but also from a channel and frequency perspective, is really a tough one. Because today, what we see is that there are clashes with TV, radio, military usage, they are different regions that use different frequencies, and the problem is that if you buy a handset or a phone one place, you might have difficulties using it another place. I think those issues of interoperability and control of the service and the experience of the user is actually a larger challenge than just pumping in new and more efficient technologies. So I think this, these are something that we, from Ericsson's perspective, are definitely gonna spend a large time on. We have acquired a few companies that uh, will help us achieve this faster uh, over the last one or two years, but there's still a long way to go in order to provide what we would call a seamless uh, mobile broadband service uh, through all technologies and all the different chunks of spectrum out there. So those are the challenges going forward. Thank you. So uh, I think it's uh, time that we, we close the session. I'd like to thank all of you for being here and listening to, to our panelists. And of course, thank our panelists uh, for sharing their experiences uh, with us. And uh, from our side, from USP Cidades, we'd like to thank the New Cities Foundation for inviting us to participate. And we'd like to tell all of you that we have our office open for collaborations, discussions, and please uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, we are. We are on the, the Facebook, on Twitter, and you can easily find us also on our website. Okay, thank you very much, and have a great uh, end of the day, afternoon. <laughs>